Thanks for joining us today. Today we're starting a new series uh, looking at the Gospel of Mark. Last week, of course, was Easter Sunday. We looked at the resurrection and before that, the death of Jesus Christ, an incredibly important moment in our belief system, in history, maybe the greatest moment of all time. Uh, and, and we just celebrated in his death, but ultimately his resurrection. Uh, but we're going to now take some time and look at the life of Jesus, right? Because it's not just how he died, but also how he lived that forms how we follow him. And so we're going to be doing that through the lens of the gospel according to Mark. And anytime we start a new series, we want to make sure we spend some time really just kind of setting the stage. What is the book about? What's the historical context? Who wrote the book? Why did he write the book? And so a little bit of backstory to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, it's written around 60 AD, so approximately 30 years after Jesus' death. And there's not really anything historically significant that shapes the book. It's, it's while the church is growing, but there's nothing really big influencing why he writes it other than he's just excited about Jesus and people coming to Jesus and he's writing this to encourage them. It's believed to be uh, the very first gospel written down. Uh, and so uh, he does this really just as an encouragement for the people around him. But we want to take just a moment to, to look at who is Mark. And Mark is actually believed to be, uh, we don't know this for sure because there's not, he doesn't actually sign it as by John Mark, but we believe this but with overwhelming evidence, both traditionally and modern day to be John Mark. And John Mark is a guy who shows up in the book of Acts. And we really want to spend a little bit of time looking at his life because the trajectory of his life, I think is really uh, relatable. He is a guy that I, I think we see kind of his life reflected in a lot of Christians. I think a lot of people have a very similar trajectory. Uh, and so John Mark is really most famous for the time in which he causes a rift between Paul and Barnabas. Uh, and, and we don't know exactly why this is, but there's been a lot of evidence to kind of piece together what really happens there. And it really paints this cool picture of who Mark is. So Mark, John Mark, and he goes by both names. Uh, and this is really common at the time. It's because uh, he has a Hebrew name, John, and a Roman name, Mark or Marcus. And so he goes by John and Mark, and he's referred to by both in the New Testament. <clears throat> He shows up in Acts 12. It's immediately following Peter's uh, escape from prison, or I should say one of Peter's escapes from prisons. God just divinely delivers him. He opens the gates. He goes running from the prison, and he ends up fleeing to the house of a woman named Mary. This is a, another Mary in the New Testament, not Mary Magdalene, not the mother of Mary, just a, another Mary, a super popular name at the time. And he goes there, and what it says is this Mary is really, related to two very important people. One, she is the sister of Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas, the guy who travels around with Paul, uh, kind of plants the early church. But she is also the mother of John, who goes also by Mark, John Mark, which makes him therefore the nephew of Barnabas. And in this moment, we don't know exactly what happens if this is the conversion moment where Peter shows up and he gives his life to Christ, but this seems to be a really marker moment for him. He just is on fire for Jesus. He's excited by what he hears about Peter's rescue. He's excited about the gospel. And so he goes and he's going to join Paul and Barnabas as they take the gospel to the lost. And it starts off just this amazing time. Everything's going well. The gospel's spreading. The people People around him are supporting him. And then they go and they leave to Cyprus, which is the hometown of Barnabas. And so things are continuing to go well. He's still surrounded by extended family. It's likely there's other Christians around. Uh, the gospel's still spreading. Things are going well until they start to head to Asia Minor and they start to run into some issues. Uh, the reality of following Jesus really kind of smacks John Mark in the face. It's all, all sunshine and rainbows. It's hard. They're, uh, they're opposed by people. They're mocked. They're ridiculed. They're hated because of their belief. John gets to this point where it, following Jesus is about really taking up your cross following him, being willing to be uh, persecuted, to suffer for the spread of the gospel. 
And when this happens, there's a story of Bar-Jesus. Really after this, uh, John just decides, I'm out. This is not what I signed up for. Uh, this is too hard. And he returns to Jerusalem. He, he's by all accounts a failure, right? He's, he's gone with Paul and Barnabas. He's, he lacks faith. He lacks conviction. He's not going to go do this. And he leaves. Uh, but the beautiful part of his story is God's not done with him. God's not done with him at all. In fact, shortly later, at least shortly in reading through the Bible, John Mark returns to travel with Paul and Barnabas. And this is probably his most famous part. When he does this, uh, Paul has no interest in allowing John Mark to return and, and go into the mission field with them, return to the mission field. He, he doesn't want him to, and we don't, again, don't know exactly why, but it really seems that he's witnessed John Mark fold under pressure. He, he, he doesn't think highly of him. They're going to go and do hard things, and he knows John Mark isn't built for that. And so he says, absolutely not. Barnabas, for whatever reason, maybe just because he's his uncle, Uncle, but maybe he's seen some growth or heard of growth. And John Mark says he wants him to come. This creates this fiery feud and they end up going their separate ways. Paul leaves with Silas, Barnabas leaves with John Mark, and then he disappears uh, to spread the gospel. But that's not the end of his story. That's not John Mark's ultimate legacy. We see that throughout the rest of the New Testament. He pops up in the writings of particularly Paul. He, he ends up reconciling with Paul and it becomes really a trusted confidant. While Paul is imprisoned, he writes about how John Mark is there beside him, supporting him. He recommends him to the church. This is a man he ends up trusting uh, to take and, and support the churches that he's planted. And then after Paul's death, we, we know through history that John Mark, he goes and he, he meets up with Peter and really becomes a, a support to Peter, kind of follows him around. And it's during this time, likely, uh, not for sure, but likely before Peter's death, where he decides to pen this gospel. He writes uh, really from all that Peter tells him about his uh, eyewitness account of Jesus. He writes it down, records it uh, to be spread throughout the world. And so what we're going to be doing, we're going to be going through for quite a bit of time, going through this gospel of Mark, really looking at uh, what this man, this man who at one point was a failure, really now has impacted millions, maybe billions of people worldwide throughout history what he recorded about Jesus through Peter. So it's the gospel of Mark, uh, but in a lot of ways, it's really the gospel of Peter, uh, but the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So today, what we're going to do for the rest of our time, we're going to go ahead and look at the first 15 chapters uh, of the book. And it's really kind of this intro, setting the stage for Jesus's ministry, kind of all the, the prep part of it, the beginning uh, that really all of it is, is necessary. He kind of glosses over a lot of it. He just plows through it. But this is a necessary part of, of Jesus's ministry that allows him to go on and perform everything that he's going to do. So let's go ahead. We're going to read through the first 15 verses. Then we'll come back and we'll pull out uh, all the major themes within. It starts off, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. And I just, I'm just going to pause right there. I'm not going to do this reading through the rest of it, but I just want to address this really quick. This, this son of God, this title has caused a lot of confusion over the years, over the decades, centuries of uh, this picture of Jesus as the son, like we would talk about a son and it, it's not how that works. Uh, that has been used by a lot of uh, Christian cults to discount who Jesus is. He's not God. He's just the human son of God. Uh, but that's not what this is. This is a title that really points to his position within the Trinity. Uh, he's talked about his son. And a lot of times we see the word begotten thrown in front of son. And it's this idea he's not like born of, created by, but instead is of the same essence. It literally is saying he is God made manifest in the flesh. And this was a title. That's why it's capital S on son. Uh, this was a, a, a divine title of God, recognizing that he was Yahweh. In fact, his, his opponents uh, during his ministry, the Pharisees, they asked him very directly, are you the son of God? They knew what this title was. And when he responded, yes, they went to stone him. 
Uh, when he responded, yes, what he was saying, I am that I am Yahweh in the flesh. This is a divine title, not really necessarily a relation to the father. So just wanted to address that before we move on. It goes on verse two, as it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Excuse me. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, in just in these 15 verses, you get a little bit of the taste of Mark's writing style. He is very rapid fire. He is just going to blast through what some of the other gospels really give a large account. He starts off, right, uh, talking about Jesus's ministry. He's not concerned with Jesus's birth, probably just because as he's receiving the eyewitness account for Peter, Peter wasn't there for his birth. This is when Peter steps on the scene, right, with John the Baptist. He himself is a follower of John the Baptist. So this is Peter's beginning with Jesus. Uh, So we're going to take a look at several things. The first thing we see is that Jesus is the fulfillment. This beginning part, this first several verses really are just about prophecy. They're about prophecy and how Jesus is going to fill prophecy that God has predicted uh, and and told the Jewish people that he is going to come. The Messiah is going to come. And there's going to be a lot of things that happen very specifically that really announce his arrival. He he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He is the one uh, of the descendant of Eve and Abraham, the one who is going to redeem them and ultimately us. And so that's what we see. He is the fulfillment. It starts off as it is written in Isaiah, the prophet. And so this is actually not just Isaiah, but a conflation of uh, Malachi as well Two two prophecies kind of put into one idea. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So Jesus being the fulfillment of prophecy, making all of these things come true also has to do with the people around him at the time, including John the Baptist. So John the Baptist actually is going to be part of this fulfillment of prophecy, announcing the arrival of Jesus. It says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In all the country of Judea, in all Jerusalem, were going out to him and were being baptized him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So here's this incredible moment in time. All these people from the surrounding area, uh, primarily or if not entirely Jewish, coming to John the Baptist. They're being baptized in the river Jordan. They're, they're repenting of their sin. Repentance is turning away from from sin back towards God. They're confessing their sins. It's this monumental event. John is gathering all these people, prepping them for the arrival of Jesus. And, and he's literally gathering. There are people, uh, Peter included, who, who call themselves followers of John the Baptist. And it's this really, really important moment that he is prepping their hearts and minds uh, to receive Jesus. So, And we talk about it's a baptism of repentance. So they're repenting of their sin, uh, but they're doing it with this physical representation of it, this baptism. 
And baptism is most commonly associated now uh, with Christianity. It's an act that we do, a marker moment of our faith, uh, this really important time. We step out in front of other followers of Christ, non-believers. We declare that we have made Jesus king of our lives and, and we're submerged in the water. We, it's, it's symbolic of a lot of things, us being buried with Jesus and then coming, uh, dying to ourselves and then being risen with him, a new creation in Christ. Uh, but that's not what's happening here. They're being baptized for something else. This is a baptism of repentance, but baptism uh, doesn't have its origins in Christianity. Baptism is actually something that exists for uh, the Jewish culture, religion for really their entirety. Uh, There's a couple of really cool things going on here. The first one, baptism is for them about ritual purification. It's about making one clean versus unclean. In Jewish culture, religion, it's all the same thing. Uh, there are, everything is either clean or unclean. And so for them to approach God, to approach the temple, uh, the holy of holies, to be in his presence, they have to be clean, right? It's to not be clean, they can't be, they cannot exist in his presence. And so they're finding ways to be clean. This is part of this becoming ritually clean. It's something that they've always done. And so, for example, if they would have touched a a dead body, they would become unclean. And so they would have to be made clean. And one of the ways that they would go about this part of this process was to be submerged in the water, to, to be declared clean, pure. They could approach God. So part of what's happening, they're being ritually cleansed, not to now approach God, but instead as God is coming to them, entering the world as Jesus coming to them to redeem them. But it's also something else. There's this really cool thing happening. About 600 BC, the Jews started this other um, practice regarding baptism, and it had to do with conversion, Right? If somebody outside the Jewish faith nation, they weren't part of the nation of Israel, wanted to become a part of them, one of the things that they would go through is they would be baptized. They would be baptized in water as this entering into this covenant of, of, of the old covenant, of the Mosaic covenant. It was this really, uh, really cool symbolism. And here they are. This is in essence what they are doing. They are being baptized in the conversion. They are leaving the old covenant, the Mosaic law, and they are entering into this new covenant. Now, it hasn't arrived just yet. It doesn't come fully until Jesus dies and rises from the dead. This is this transition period. I don't think they're even really aware fully of all that's going on, but it's this momentous moment of where they are turning to God, really prepping for his arrival. And I, I just wonder what this looked like. I mean, they're, it says they're repenting, they're being baptized, they're, they're confessing their sins. Are they just like blurting it out before and after they go in the water? Just this moment of transparency, just incredible. Uh, but it's all John the Baptist preparing the way. And uh, it's really interesting because they're coming to John and John's kind of a weirdo, right? Like he's just this really odd guy. Verse six describes him. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey, right? They, they get this description of John, which actually speaks to the fulfillment of prophecy as well. And there's a lot of stuff going on here, at least believed to be some understanding of why. Why does he eat locusts? Like, why is this weird hippie guy out in the wilderness eating weird food, locusts and wild honey? And there's some belief maybe this is symbolic of 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 the Gentiles coming into the fold. I have no idea if any of this is true. It's some interesting thoughts, but there is something very specific happening here. John is fulfilling prophecy. See the, the messenger, the one who is proclaiming Jesus's arrival in Malachi is talked about is, is Elijah. And it wasn't meant to be specifically Elijah coming back, but really the spirit of Elijah and this description of John in camel's hair and wearing a leather belt. This is how Elijah would appear. This is to draw this this connection between John and Elijah that he is fulfilling, again, prophecy in doing this. And, And John's doing all this. I said he's gathering all these people. But he's doing this not to gather people really to him. It's all done for the arrival of Jesus. He's gathering them to himself simply to point them to Jesus. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, 
the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John just points straight to Jesus. All of this is done for Jesus. All this submersion in the water, right? It's, it's, it's all good. It's repenting's good, but it's not for John. It's not to him. It's really for Jesus and what is going to come. And he points to this baptizing you with the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus is going to accomplish. And I really have to wonder that they even understand what this means. Because what John was pointing to is, is Jesus through his work, through the Holy Spirit was going to create this union between man and God, this restoration of union, but also that would be realized in them being indwelled by the Holy Spirit. They would be baptized, literally immersed by the Holy Spirit. And this was uh, something that we look at nowadays, we see in scripture, this was not something that they would have been familiar with. This would probably be mind blowing. This was a confusing statement, I have to imagine, because at that point in time, right, the Holy Spirit would appear on people, work through people, but it was a specific person for a specific time, for a specific reason. It was often a leader of Israel uh, to guide God's people. The idea of the Holy Spirit just coming in all believers, God residing in people was, was just far off out there. And I have to imagine they just missed it. This was, there's excitement, but they're not getting the picture, the full picture of what's gonna happen uh, in, in, until after Jesus' death and resurrection. And then after this, right, as, as this is all happening, one day it says, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. I just, could you imagine that day you're down by the river and here comes Jesus, right? He's joining you. The guy John has been talking about shows up. He's, he's face to face with you. And John recognized him and Jesus is there to be baptized, which is a really interesting Thing. Why does Jesus need to be baptized? Yeah. And, and John himself, we were trying to stay in Mark, but I just can't pass this up. John's like, Jesus, I have no right to baptize you. You should be baptizing me. And yet Jesus says, I have to do this. Uh, and, and he really pushes John to do it. It's a really important, necessary thing that he does. Uh, but I just have to, like, why? Why is Jesus being baptized? Remember, it's a baptism of repentance, and Jesus has nothing to repent for. Like that's the essence of Jesus, his nature. He is the one without sin. He's never once sinned, so he has nothing to repent for, which I'll be honest with you, out of all the, the kind of uh, supernatural, crazy things in the Bible, a triune God who exists outside of time and space, the idea of eternity, heaven and hell and, 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 and spiritual realm and physical realm. The one that kind of boggles my mind the most is this truth, that Jesus never sinned, that he had nothing to repent for. He's like 30 years old is, is our best guess. Right? When he shows up here, 30 years old, and he doesn't have a single thing to repent for. I'm 38, uh, and I have uh, way more than I wish I, I had to repent for. Like, I, I've had to repent for so much throughout my life. Uh, I'm raising four kids right now. We have kids between one and nine years old. Like, they have plenty every day to repent for. And here's Jesus, 30 years old, and he's done nothing wrong. That means Jesus has made it through the terrorist two ages. He's made it through the three ages. He's made it through like those teen years, those sassy, disrespectful to parents. If you've had middle schoolers, right? They just like to push buttons for the sake of pushing buttons. He's gone through all of that without sinning, right? And, and just, uh, just a quick thing. We have now three kids about to enter into all three of those stages at once. So please, please pray for us, um, right? He goes beyond that. He then goes, he's going to go through being a young man going through puberty. One of the darkest moments, at least for my life, uh, and he makes it through there sinless. He becomes an adult without the authority of his parents over him, right? He's, he's free to, to rule his own life and he doesn't sin. He shows up 30 years later and he's got nothing to be repented for. So why, why is he being baptized? What's he doing here? And there's a couple of really cool ideas why Jesus would be baptized. The first is, it's this connection with humanity, 
right? He is fully God, but he is fully human. He has been tempted like we have been tempted. He's surrounded by sin and he has nothing to repent for, but he's joining us in this baptism where we have to repent, he doesn't. And yet he associates himself with sinners. The one who knew no sin associates himself with sinners in this really intimate, important moment. But also uh, what's happening is also, is deeply symbolic. See, Jesus is being baptized by John the Baptist. And what we know of John the Baptist, one, he's, he is a cousin of Jesus. We're not sure if they really knew each other or not. But John the Baptist also comes from the tribe of Levi. Levi excuse me. Both his parents are known uh, direct descendants through the tribe of Levi. And this is a nation, well, sub-nation, a tribe of priests. And one of their responsibilities was to present the sacrifice to God. And so here is Jesus going to John the Baptist. John is pre uh, uh, presenting what is to be the ultimate sacrifice, the one true sacrifice, the end all sacrifices to the father, right? Just prepping Jesus for what he's going to do. This is the one who is going to pay the price for all of our sins. It's this incredible moment of Jesus uh, just, just revealing who he is through all he does. It's beautiful. And then, what we see next is as Jesus comes out of this water, this really powerful moment in which we see that Jesus is loved. Jesus is loved. So it says here, verse 10, and when he came up out of the water immediately, he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice came from heaven. This moment, this whole passage, right? We're gonna see really the nature of God and we'll get to the, he is loved, but I just I want to pause here for a minute. This is a deep theological passage right here in which we see the picture of a triune God, the Trinity, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, all of them existing as one. And this word Trinity or triune, it doesn't actually appear anywhere in the Bible. It's a word that was created uh, to describe the nature of God, three persons in one Godhead, um, and it's pieced together, our understanding it from a lot of different evidence, particularly in the New Testament. And this one is incredibly important because it, it speaks to what does that actually look like? Three persons and one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And it really speaks against some of the, the, the wrong beliefs, this, what we would call modalism. Right? The, the idea that God is, is one God, one person, that he's just like a transformer, a, a shapeshifter. He goes between Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this, this, this picture of God that doesn't actually exist in the Bible. What we do see instead is all three persons of the Godhead existing at once. So we have the Son coming up out of the water, Jesus, the Son coming up out of the water. We have the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove and then the God the Father speaking to him, all three at once existing in the same place at the same time, interacting with each other. And it's this cool picture of what the Trinity actually looks like. And in the midst of this, right, God the Father and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And it speaks to the nature of this triune relationship. This is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They exist in this perfect love relationship. That is the nature of their relationship. That's really the nature of God, of Yahweh. He is love. And here he is just declaring his love for his son, Jesus Christ. You are loved I am pleased with you. And it's this, this incredibly powerful moment that really speaks to their relationship, but really kind of forms the relationship God has with us as his creation. Because out of this love, we see the depth of his love for us. We see the depth of his love for us. The first thing of this, right? He says this to Jesus before he goes to the cross before he accomplishes all his miracles, before he redeems humanity, this is what God declares about Jesus. I love you, I am pleased, not because of what he has done, simply because of who he is. That's how he views Jesus. 
And it's not there directly, but what we see through the rest of scripture is this love he has for the son, right? Is he has for us in a sense. We are his children. He loves us not because of what we do or really despite everything we do, all our rebellion, the fact that we were enemies of him, that he was willing to go to the depths of sacrificing his one and only son to redeem us. That is how much God loves us. That is how he views us. He loves us. He loves us regardless of anything else in our lives. And he then sacrifices Jesus on the cross for us. The one he loves most, he gives up for us. It's this encouraging moment for us. It's this encouraging moment for Jesus. And it really paints the severity of what happens on the cross. Because later in the story, what's going to happen at the end is Jesus is nailed to the cross as he heads to his death. He takes the weight of sin upon, of the world upon his shoulders. The father's going to turn his back on him. He's gone from, I love you. I love you deeply. I'm pleased with you too. I can't even look at you because of the sin that you now have. Jesus was willing to go through that because he loves us. What's also happening here is just this affirmation of Jesus. This is before Jesus does everything, right? This is as he's heading into his ministry and what's going to be a really trying time in just a minute. He is encouraging Jesus, reminding him who he is as he's about to go through the really highs of his ministry, all the miracles and the people coming to him and the lows, the rejection, uh, the mocking, the brutal death that he's going to suffer and really what's going to happen in the desert in just the moment. And he just reminds Jesus, I love you. I am pleased with you. And it's this beautiful picture of the love a father should have for his children, right? He's modeling really what we should be modeling for our children ourselves. This, this, the, really, do your children know like Jesus knows that the, you as a parent love them? As we talk about discipling our kids, it's not just about what we teach them out of the Bible, we read to them and explain to them. It's about what do we model to them? Are we modeling this? Are we saying to our kids, do they know that they are loved by you unconditionally, regardless of what they do? Maybe you don't approve of what they do, but you love them. They need to know that in fathers, right? We have a unique responsibility because what our children, how our children view us and the love we have for them is shaping, whether we like it or not, it is shaping how they view the love of the father, their heavenly father towards them. Are your children safe and secure in the truth that you love them? He does this right. He does this as an encouragement because now Jesus is going to go through this incredibly trying time. And what we're going to see is Jesus is the last Adam. It says that Jesus is sent into the desert. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And this is uh, one of my absolute favorite, favorite stories in all of the gospels. Uh, it, it's this incredible moment. Jesus goes and he's being tempted by Satan. And we see how Satan operates and deceives and Jesus resists them by quoting scripture and just relying upon God, his obedience and all, just this amazing moment. And uh, none of it's actually in the book of Mark. Right. I often joke with the teaching team, this is my least favorite gospel, which is 100% a joke. I don't really know what that means, but uh, I'm a detail guy and he just blasts over this story. He gives it three sentences. It's really deep. There's a lot going on. Uh, and we're not going to really touch on any of that stuff I just shared because we're trying to stick to Mark and yet there's still significance here. So what happens, right? God sends him into the desert. The Holy Spirit drives him out. This is purposeful. This is for a reason. Uh, beyond that, this is necessary. This has to happen, what he's about to accomplish there. He's out in the wilderness and it says, uh, he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. And all of this is, is really this cool contrast with Adam in Eden. It's not there directly, but it's what we piece it together through all of scripture. What's happening, Jesus is going to the wilderness. He's being contrasted again with Adam being placed in Eden. Adam is placed in 
perfection, God's perfect place unmarred by sin. And he's there where he is tempted by Satan. And in that, what we see Adam and really what representing all of humanity, right? They cannot resist temptation. They fall to it. They sin. The, the sin enters the world. Perfect union with God is broken. And here's Jesus really going and restoring all that. He's doing the opposite of that. He goes to the wilderness, what is kind of this representation of the farthest thing from Eden. It's a desolate, barren place. There's no provision like Adam has in the garden. It's, it's harsh. It's unlivable. It talks about wild animals where in the garden of Eden, Adam's surrounded by the animals he has dominion over and God's like working with him as he's taking care of the animals here. Like it's just a miserable place, but there, there Jesus is tempted by Satan. And where Adam fails, where Adam is disobedient, Jesus is obedient. Where Adam gives into temptation, where Adam sins, Jesus resists temptation. He defeats Satan. He resists Satan. And this moment is necessary for him to be the perfect sacrifice, for him to be the unblemished lamb, right? He has to undo what Adam has done. He is the last Adam. He's uh, often called the perfect Adam. He resists sin. He knows no sin. This moment is absolutely necessary. It has to happen before he can enter into his ministry and go to the cross. He knows no sin. He's now ready to move forward uh, to proceed within his ministry. And we wrap up Mark 14 and 15. Uh, we wrap up today. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus has fulfilled all the prophecy of his arrival. He's resisted Satan. He's ready to go. He's moving forward now in his ministry. It's begun. And this is what he's sharing, right? It's fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. The time has arrived. Uh, it's coming at hand means it's like, it's right there. It's about to come. Jesus is going to go through his ministry and bring in the new covenant. And he calls them really to everything that he's going to teach repent, turn away from sin, back to God and believe in the gospel. Believe in the good news of Jesus Christ that he will die and through grace we will be redeemed. And I want to end on this idea that, that he is now bringing the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus was about, was about bringing the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven to earth, merging the two. It wasn't about just getting people to heaven, right? Restoring union, but he was restoring everything. He was restoring us. He was bringing the kingdom of God really to invade our hearts and our lives. And I just want to end with that question uh, as our release to the campuses, uh, something they're going to cover. Has Jesus have you allowed Jesus, have you allowed the kingdom of God to invade your lives? Thank you guys. I love you and have a great day. Thanks for sticking around for a transformational moment. And I just want us to, to really answer that question for us to ponder that. Is the kingdom of God invading your heart? Have you allowed all aspects of your life? And I really taking that, that Jewish idea of heart, like really everything about you has every aspect of your life surrendered to the kingdom of God. Are you allowing Jesus, the Holy Spirit to transform and have ownership over every aspect of your life? Because that's what Jesus desired. That's what he wanted. He wanted the kingdom of God, not just to affect earth in this like vague sense, but really for your whole entire life, your heart to be transformed by him. Thank you guys. Have a great day.